All right, we're going to start our presentation now. Thank you all for coming to Clean Texas uh, Power Hour this evening. Uh, those of you who are familiar with our regular power lunches, this is a bit of an experimentation, uh, a variation on the power lunch. Uh, we got some feedback from members that it might be easier to attend an event in the early evening than it would be during lunchtime. Uh, and so many thanks to our sister organization, ATI and IC Squared, for giving us this venue this evening. Uh, and uh, we're going to hear from uh, some folks from Civic Farms, Dr. Rebecca Knight and Mr. Paul Harday. Did I get that right? Great. Okay. And, you know, to me, it's really interesting this evening to be talking about, you know, vertical, or, you know, urban farming, local produce, because this is an important topic, not just in terms of reduction of carbon footprint, but also in terms of food security. And the reason I'm mentioning this is those of you who've been keeping track of the news today, there's the possibility that Puerto Rico, which unfortunately sustained a direct hit from the hurricane, uh, maybe without its power grid for several months rather than several weeks. And in that context, again, I think, I think that that's another aspect of the food security benefits of local farming uh, that are sometimes overlooked. Um, and so what we'd like to do uh, this evening is explore some of the research and development work that's going on at Biosphere 2 and also to talk about where Civic Farms is as a company and where they're headed. So with that, let me turn it over to our speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, I just first want to mention what a pleasure it is to be here representing Civic Farms. My name is Rebecca Knight, and this is Paul Harday. I would like to first give thanks to Heather Rose for, uh, for setting this up. And also want to uh, thank Mitch Jacobson for uh, with ATI as well. Um, <clears throat> so real quickly, uh, my background is in engineering, and I did my undergraduate in chemical engineering. So for me, process engineering is sort of um, that's where I feel at home. Um, I, things happened. I ended up going into multiple fields in renewable energy, and then that led me to microalgae which I promised Paul not to talk <laughs> not to about talk because I will go on and on and on. That's right. <laughs> um, but then that led me to plant biology and it led me to studying how wavelength affects photosynthesis. And so I had the pleasure of meeting Paul <clears throat> at a job position um, at an LED lighting company where he taught me everything he knows uh, about vertical farming. And we have embarked on this exciting adventure with Civic Farms. And with that, I'm going to let Paul introduce himself and uh, take it from there. Awesome. So. Thank you. Uh, good evening, my name is Paul Hardy. I'm a co-founder and CEO of Civic Farms. Um, I'm originally from Warsaw, Poland. I'm an architect. We've been in real estate development business for about uh, 15, 16 years in Chicago until the market crashed in 2008. And in 2009, I was trying to rebrand myself and figure out something to do. And I was invited by a colleague of mine to a presentation by Dr. Dixon Despomier from Columbia University on future of food. And this is about a time where he was launching his book called Vertical Farm. Any of you who have more interest in local or sustainable or food or vertical farming, I strongly encourage uh, get a copy of this, this book. It's an easy read. It's a great roadmap of what vertical farming could be. Okay. Vertical Farm. Just go to verticalfarm.com, verticalfarming.com, Dixon Despomier. A fantastic book, great read. So he really is considered the father of, of vertical farming uh, industry. And he was the visionary who inspired people like me around the world who jumped on the bandwagon and, and tried to figure this out. So in 2009, early 2010, I established the first prototype vertical farm in Chicago uh, in the middle of a food desert, uh, uh, purposely, where people need jobs and there's no access to local fresh food. Uh, we wanted to put a vacant building to work and create jobs and you know create revenue for the local municipality and so forth. And uh, from that point on, I ended up on Mayor Daly's task force in Chicago, right, working on rewriting Chicago zoning codes and building codes to define urban ag agriculture in a modern term. Because from an architect's point of view, it's a big challenging uh, project where we're trying to farm in cities. And farming is understood by everybody in a traditional sense. So, you know, zoning codes and regulations envision farming like, you know, just chicken running around the streets, and which is not something that we want to do and we don't do. Um, so from that point on, I moved on and developed a first uh, true commercial scale vertical farm in the U.S., which actually was organic certified by USDA uh, using aquaponic growing technology. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with aquaponics. I'll actually show you a video in a couple of minutes 
So you can see how that farm looked. We got it to scale through venture capital and, and friends and family and our own money, uh, servicing a couple hundred grocery stores in Chicago, Whole Foods Market, and, and, and many others growing local, organic, certified leafy greens. And this really was a prototype. So we had a number of challenges on the technology side. On regulatory side, we worked with local, state, and federal governments um, on regulations regarding food safety, food security, things that we talked about, but mostly food safety process, understanding of what vertical farming is about. But first, before we get into this in more detail, how many of you actually know about vertical farming? Okay, so you've heard about it. Okay, great. How many of you have seen a vertical farm? Okay, great. So, so with that, maybe uh, what I'll do is play, play a quick four-minute video to show you our first venture in Chicago. Uh, so you can understand how actually vertical farm works and looks and feels and that's going to make my job and rebecca's job easier to explain to you what we're about to do okay so with that uh can you please yeah. help me thank you great and let's see if we can get sound i hope we have sound there is no sound i don't so. think so no, yeah. it's not playing from there. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can do it from here. Yeah, yes. that's before they closed the door. They they came out to our farm and did a really nice segment. Didn't you on like the PBS News? Yes, we were on NPR, PBS, BBC, you name it. I mean, you, you can? Yeah, let's play. It's just a <laughs> And we've seen the Great. wonders so of this base we'll of Borrelia Coming Next. Okay, awesome, thanks. Hey guys, welcome back to Techno. I'm Phil Torres with Marita Davison and Dr. Crystal Dorth. So we've seen the wonders of this basil. Well, what do you have coming up for us next? Well, next I get to take a look at how basil plants and tilapia fish are living in harmony and doing it all indoors. <laughs> For most of us, these are the images that come to mind when we think of farms. Rows of produce spanning out to the horizon, farmers using machines to fertilize their crops. But at this warehouse farm outside of Chicago, the rows go up and fish do the work of fertilizing the produce. One, two, three, go. <laughs> They're hungry. That means they're healthy. Paul Harvey is the co-founder of Farmed Here. Imagine a pond with fish swimming in water and plants living around it. It's exactly what we're trying to replicate indoors. And it's a symbiotic relationship between fish and plants, and, uh, and that's how we grow our crops. These fish are part of an aquaponic growing system. The water from these tanks, complete with fish waste, flows through a system of filters. There, natural bacteria will break the waste down into nitrates before the water is cycled to the plants. Nitrates are the most available plant foods on the planet. So the nutrient-rich water from the fish tanks is moved onto the uh, area of our grow systems where the plants live. Uh, the plants take the nutrients, they actually filter the water, and the water recirculates back in the fish. This aquaponic system helped Farm Here become the only commercial indoor farm to be certified organic by the USDA. Do you need to add any other supplements or do the fish provide all of the nutrients? It depends on the type of crops that we grow. Our focus at this point is leafy greens. We grow basil, arugula, kale, variety of salad mixes, but we also have very successful trials with tomatoes, strawberries, and more heavy feeding plants. So it's nice you need to supplement. It's more like taking vitamins <laughs> that, that both of us could take. It's kind of the same process. Produce harvested in this 90,000 square foot warehouse is destined for the shelves of more than 80 grocery stores in the Chicago area. So here you see uh, we're using fluorescent lighting. That's how we started about uh, four years ago. We're in a transition of uh, switching our lighting technology to LEDs. Farm here recently partnered with lighting manufacturer Illumitex to make the switch to LED grow lights. Harday hopes LEDs will help the company expand its crops beyond leafy greens. They have developed a, uh, a very good LED solution for the more demanding crops like strawberries and peppers and tomatoes. We strongly believe that this could be done 
personally. Right now, the fish are here merely to help you with the growth of the plant crops, but are you going to start farming the fish too? Yes, we will. Eventually, we're going to start farming the fish and selling fish. Actually, we already uh, had some success selling fish to local restaurants. And as our scale grows and uh, we have more fish to sell, we hope to sell to supermarkets as well. This is Thai basil, so it's got actually a little different flavor. Feel free to try if you would like to. It's my favorite, actually. Oh, that smells so it good. smells different than Italian basil, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Right now, there are only a handful of commercial indoor vertical farms in the United States, like farm here. The traditional farming for commodity crops is still going to be there for, for a long, long time. But you have to look at the economical equation, because farming is technically subsidized. What would be the real cost of traditional farming? And what is the real impact on the environment of traditional farming? We're trying to build a for-profit model and show the world that we don't need to be subsidized. We can make, you know, stand on our own legs and make it economically viable. Cool. So that was our first farm in Chicago. Since then, the, at, at this point, there are probably about 4,000 vertical farms around the world. Uh, a lot of them in Japan, they call them plant factories. Probably not a good marketing name in the U.S. Uh, but... Uh, you know, that's, that's exactly what we've done at, at scale. Um, something that now, you know, following up on what I said in this video, this is 2013, I think, um, you know, where we talked about traditional farming versus, you know, controlled environment agriculture, basically, what do we do? And I just came to a conclusion recently, and now I share it with everybody, every presentation we make, and we talk all over the world, uh, is, look, pretty much everything we do that's successful, we do indoors, correct? We're indoors teaching each other, we're living indoors, we're you know, giving birth indoors, we're, you know, we're teaching, we're manufacturing, we're making every, all the good stuff indoors in a controlled environment. The only thing we still do outdoors is farming. So when you think about that, you know, uh, it, it's a really big challenge because of scale of farming industry. Uh, but I think the technology is already there, as we have proven in many others, to take, to take the, all the uncertainty that traditional farmers need to deal with and usually leads to you know them being subsidized and, and not being able to make money, take a lot of those risks out of the equation on the business side and really control the environment, control the process and, and produce food uh, in a more controllable manner. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Rebecca and we'll go for some of our slides and tell you about Vertical Farming 2.0, civic farms and the future of this industry. And I'm gonna go through this relatively quickly uh, because I wanna leave plenty of time at the end for interactive Q&A. That being said, if there's something that that uh, you're you're dying to ask us, please don't hesitate to interrupt at any point. But I definitely want to leave some time for discussion at the end. Um, so uh, there's a lot of wording here. Basically, vertical farming is growing and harvesting the food indoors, um, and it can include other crops besides leafy greens. A lot of research is going on right now on doing some of these indoors. It's it's trickier than you would think. Um, but there's a big push for learning how to grow different crops in controlled environment conditions. Uh, obviously, we're using artificial lighting, but that doesn't mean that this is less efficient than using the sun. And we can talk about that more later, but a lot of it has to do with the type of wavelengths that plants need, um, as well as being able to provide it directly to the plants when they need it. So um, that's, that's something that I have a lot of background in, and I'm more than happy to discuss that more. Um, and uh, right now, there's uh, over 600 known vertical farming companies. In fact, I believe it's even... 4,000 total it's, number it's of farms, the thousand. And ventures, yes. Yeah. So there's quite a few. Uh, Japan, as Paul mentioned, is very big on vertical farming. They um, use a lot of automation, robotics, and typically do a clean room style. Um, and in fact, the picture at the very top right of this slide uh, is from a, a vertical farm in Japan. I was running on conveyor belts. So um, principles have, have many different size applications and markets, and oftentimes it's to meet customer demand for local, locally grown food. That's a really big deal. And in a city like Austin, where we have a lot of local growers and we have a lot of people that are concerned about, about miles on food, um, it's, a great, it's a great product to have, to have locally where people are consuming it. Um, and also to repair damaged ecosystems and produce food sustainably. So, as you know, in 20 years, at least 
eighty percent over eighty percent of us are going to live in cities. Uh, we so we have this continual move to the cities. Farms use over seventy percent of the available fresh water on the planet. Agricultural runoff is a major issue uh, that affects estuaries as well as uh, bays and harbors with um, uh, eutrophication and dead zones. So it's a major issue. Um, and 80% of the arable landmass is already being used. So um, the future of agriculture as we see it is growing soilless. And it's not just us. You'll notice there are a lot of centers around the world that are growing in size, that are doing this kind of research and, and building systems for soilless agriculture. Um, for example, you'll see um, on the right hand side the controlled environment agriculture education which is going on with Dr. Jean Giacomelli that's at the Center for or Controlled Environment Agricultural Center at University of Arizona and we actually happen to be partnering with them um, with Civic Farms and I'll let Paul talk about that in a little bit but um, there's a lot of there's a lot of controlled environment agriculture going on already so um, really what we're saying is we need to apply these indoor technologies um, and we need to put it into a form that's sustainable and vertical farming. So top advantages of the vertical farm is consistent year-round crop produ production. So in traditional farming, you're at the whim, plants are at the whim of, of the environment and, and potential storms and sunlight. And so by having, bringing that indoors, you have the controllability of the process. You're able to control the operations of the, of the production. Um, freshness. You're not shipping food very far, so you have very fresh food. It can yield 30 to 100 times what a traditional farm can produce, and that's not including uh, layering. So you can... And it's not including mm -hmm. shrinkage, too, because big, big part true. of you know, food loss and we're mm -hmm. on produce side, the average, actually, 60% yeah. of leafy greens don't get to a consumer. When you say 30 to 50% more, Per meter or yes. per square foot. Per, on yep. per square foot per basis, area. you know, depends on the yeah. crop. Vertical farms, and we, as we have proven, and others, we can produce th thirty to hundred times more per square foot. So, uh, give you an idea, USDA two thousand eight. Uh, you can in Salinas Valley, perfect soil conditions, you can grow point uh, uh, nine eight pounds of basil per square foot. And in a, in a, in a vertical uh, farm like this, you can grow. Uh, about 20 to 30 pounds of basil per square foot on an annual basis. So, did, did you I say 60% of leafy greens? Yes, 60% yes. of leafy greens that are harvested off the field actually don't end up in your refrigerator. And then, of the ones so, in your refrigerator, we still waste 40%. Well, yeah. I mean, usually you, well, you bring this home, correct? And mm -hmm. two days later, you open your CRISPR drawer and you look at the science experiments, correct? I mean, that's usually yeah. how it looks. So, mm -hmm. and we all have that experience, and even with uh, hydroponically grown. Um, lettuces from greenhouses because they still come from Mexico, they still come from Salinas Valley, they still come from uh, Limington area in Canada. So um, what, what the Rebecca is talking about is food miles that impact not only carbon footprint, but impact quality, taste, and most importantly, nutritional value. Because the minute your crop is harvested, it's decaying, and nutritional value, as we have proven through our research and tests and actual data, I'll give you an example, our vitamin A or B or C content or uh, beta carotenes in our leafy greens grown out of Chicago farm were anywhere from 100 to 300 percent higher than any comparable organic certified product from U.S. grown farm from California, just because our crops are fresher. So uh, consistent year-round pricing, that's an important one. We're talking about business here, correct? So it's not only what's good for the planet, but can we make money doing it? And interesting, interestingly enough, to follow up on that 60 percent loss, uh, when the crops get, get to a grocery store, usually grocery stores lose money in the produce aisle. They, they very rarely make money in the produce aisle, especially with leafy greens. An average about 38% of what they purchase is not getting sold. So that's called shrink, all right? They call it shrink either because they literally shrink or it's a shrink of their dollars, correct? So we can fix that. Sorry, can I No, just please, jump in? yeah, okay. jump in. So, um, <laughs> so, yeah. you know, so consistent quality, and that's something that's unheard of actually in, in, in mm. produce or farming. Uh, when a grocery store or restaurant buyer needs to make decisions, they usually make those decisions seasonally, and, and every day they have to manage their supply chain, which is extremely difficult. For example, now we're working with Amazon Fresh, um, and we're launching in a few markets now uh, where we're going to be able to supply their on-demand, you know, quick delivery, local, consistent quality 
uh, consistent pricing produce, which is really unheard year of. Year-round. Yeah, year-round, mm -hmm. exactly, regardless of geographical mm -hmm. location. Uh, and, and so that's, that's very important from the business point of view. Uh, conserving resources, that statistic of 98% less water usage. So what you saw, you saw recirculating hydroponic growth systems. I'm not going to get into details of aquaponics versus aeroponics versus hydroponics. We can spend hours talking about it. But in principle, when we pump water into our growth systems, that water is being recirculated for a very long time. So our actual water usage comparing to traditional farms in the U.S., it's 98.8% less, and the reason we don't put it in our presentations is because people think we're crazy. Uh, but actually, that's the case. Just the idea of the vertical farm in Chicago, 90,000 square foot facility, facility had a monthly water bill, which included all of our growth systems, washing the floors, mm -hmm. cleaning coffee makers, toilets in the office, and so forth, 450 bucks a month. So that gives you an idea of you know what actual water consumption. And not to mention agriculture runoff, because we don't dispose any of our waste, not to mention our waste is organic, but put that aside even, we're not disposing any of our waste into fields. We dispose our Yale waste to a municipal sewer system, which then that waste is being treated just like any other waste. Um, so we're reducing agriculture runoff, um, obviously repurposing vacant buildings and creating a lot of green collar technology mm -hmm. jobs. And mm -hmm. that's a really big one. The example of Chicago farm, uh, when we started very early, we were able to find few people who knew a little bit about hydroponics by growing weed in their basements. But, you know, beyond that, it's hard to develop workforce, and there is no workforce that has any experience. So we partnered with City Colleges of Chicago and Chicago Botanic Garden and launched a non-for-profit called Windy City Harvest. Uh, we have trained over 2,000 kids in Chicago and youth from inner city uh, type of environments. Uh, in a 12-week, uh, um, I'm sorry, 12-week and then, you know, uh, a longer program to a real certified, you know, indoor vertical farming growing program. The program is still going and growing and there are many more around the country. So it's one of the things we can mm -hmm. do in places like Texas too. So. You want to? You talk about Okay, I'll, I'll take okay. the challenges. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is a very highly interdisciplinary uh, field. There's a lot of, a lot of uh, separate types of research and study that come together to make a successful vertical farm. For example, you have sort of my research, which is with light and how that affects plant growth and vitamin content and uh, what stages you use it in. Just that alone is very complex. Um, you also have automation. You have sensors. Um, you have construction. construction. Yeah, food safety. Food safety. Worker safety and so forth. Um, yeah, there, there, there's a lot involved. Regulations. And um, I, I love hearing Paul tell a story about Farmed Here, which I've heard so many times. But I, every single time, it, it's amazing. It, but I think a lot of it, um, uh, besides besides Paul being oh, awesome on. and you know, a great uh, entrepreneur, <laughs> has to do with his architectural background and being able to talk with city council and being able to get into the city that way. So having all of these different skill sets come together in just the right way is what makes vertical farming successful. So it's very hard, and we've seen a lot of companies struggle. They may be very good at operations, but they're not so good at marketing. You know, they, they, they can't seem to get packaging right. Or, or they seen... may be good in technology, but they're exactly. very bad at operations, correct? Right. So, and we also have seen a lot of vertical farms around the world focus on a single technology. And that's really what Civic Farms which sets us mm -hmm. apart from everybody else now because we have learned our own lessons too. When we focused on one technology solutions and we figured out, okay, we're going to build our business around that. And it was a complete mistake because when it comes to food, there are so many varieties of crops and so many different sales channels and markets that you need to deal with and localities and so forth. It, you have to build it the other way around. So we have to figure out what people want to eat, how much they're willing to pay for it, and then find a technology that allows us to grow it indoors and make a profit on top of it, correct? So Civic Farms is technologically agnostic, which means we have our own inventions and our own patents and a portfolio of technologies, but we also embrace other ideas from other people and work with other vertical farms around the world. And that's because we recognize that there are a lot of components and it's constantly changing. There's a lot of innovation going on in all of these separate components. Um, and so this is just a fun graphic that we put together <laughs> that shows you an idea of all the different areas of research and understanding that come together in vertical farming. So. Yes. Regarding the use of other technologies, yeah. and forgive the old intellectual property attorney, but 
I'm curious, is that done through licensing of their technologies? Do you provide consulting yes. to their... It's, it's both. So, mm -hmm. so, yeah, let's make it more interactive than the PowerPoint yeah. because I think sure. it's more fun. So, yeah. uh, actually, it's one of the reasons we partner with the University of Arizona and Biosphere because we needed to find a platform where we can test and scale technologies really quickly and say if they you know, work or not because this business, is, as Rebecca was saying, is very complex and very expensive. So one of the biggest challenges we had with our first farm was the R&D component of it and not only figuring out our own technologies, but even if we want to license somebody's technology, there is no proof that it works in scale. And to put it in scale takes millions of dollars, correct? Because you need to build a facility and incorporate the technology into it. So the way we've designed our farm that's going to be built very soon at Biosphere in Tucson is that we're going to have three components over there. One is R&D, where we work at University of Arizona. We have a 15-year research agreement in place uh, where we just put our efforts together uh, into joint IP. Um, and then um, we're going to do a real production facility in the same building where we're going to be able to test something at a laboratory level and quickly take it to scale and see if it works or not. And then obviously, you know, take it further and commercialize that idea. So. Uh, the third one is education, which is equally important because we want to educate the public about vertical farming. We want to educate the workforce. We want to educate investors, entrepreneurs, uh, scientists, and we want to educate you know architects and engineers that need to come and you know patent lawyers and you name it. Um, there are a lot of opportunity for IP protection. However, interestingly enough, as Rebecca mentioned, that vertical farming or hydroponic controlled environment agriculture world is developing very fast, as fast as some other technologies. So at some point, you know, w w what's the value of IP? I think the value of IP in vertical farming is only if you create a really large portfolio of pieces and components and elements that make the entire process work because you just can't build a vertical farm based on one single idea of I have a better hydroponic system than you do. It's not going to work. So uh, let's see if we can go through this. So yeah, we're calling so this Vertical Farm 2.0. And a lot of it has to do with what Paul mentioned and how we're handling IP and technology. Um, and we we see that um, let's see that there are some advantages over traditional farming, but the two things that are big challenges still is the high entry capital requirement. So it requires a very large investment. Yes. And yes. then also and high labor cost. the labor cost. All right. So maybe so, I can talk about sure. this for a little bit. So because sure. uh, we're give, we're not here to sell you the idea of vertical yeah, farming. We're here to teach you what we know, basically, and tell you good and bad. Correct. So the bad part it takes millions of dollars because food business. Uh, how many of you, by the way, are in any type of food business or food processing? Okay, cool. So you know, food is huge. Correct. And to do to make I don't know fresh squeezed juices or coffee, whatever, you need to have scale. To make it work because margins typically are very low now interestingly enough margins in vertical farming are very very nice but um put that aside it requires a lot of capital so that's one and then all the technologies that have been developed in hydroponics mostly by growing pots okay and you know in the basements over the last you know literally guys i mean that's where the innovation mm -hmm. came from okay and now mm -hmm. some of these ideas that work in a closet scale not necessarily work at a very, very large scale, and especially from the labor point of view. So a lot of the early techniques that were developed and used by companies like our first venture in Chicago and other vertical farms were very labor intensive. And that's something that needs to be addressed. So it's a challenge, and the industry is addressing this challenge now by automation, robotics, and so forth. Um, the, on the operating side, for example, what we have done is we developed a number of growing solutions, and I'm not going to get into too much of a technology here tonight, but uh, where we really grow inside the container, for example. So we figure out a way to grow inside uh, the clamshell that you're going to bring home with your basil. That basil will be grown from seed to harvest without anybody touching it, pretty much. So it reduces labor costs by about 70%. Um, and increases shelf life. And increases shelf life, exactly. And, and by the mm -hmm. way, speaking of shelf life, there's an interesting statistic, mm -hmm. too. Uh, an average crop, when you harvest in, you know, here in Austin and you would take it to a grocery store next morning from our farm, would have about two week shelf life. That's actually what they're good for, which is amazing. That tells you that normally with you know California to Austin food miles or California to Chicago, California to New York, even worse, okay, they're in transport for about 10 days. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, from the farmer literally to your refrigerator, it's at least 10 days. Um, so again, who is Civic Farms? We can 
probably just skip that, but basically okay. we are a biotechnology company, we're a consumer brand company, it's a very complicated business. We're technology, data mining and development and real estate development operations because a big part of vertical farming is dealing with real estate. So it's not any different than being a big box retailer. You have to find a pretty good location, negotiate your lease, get your zoning and building permits and build it and design it. And a lot of process and design has to go into the building. Something Rebecca mentioned earlier, the process design, the understanding of the literally, I'm sorry to call it manufacturing of food, but that's what it is. It's not any different than manufacturing anything else. Um, this is our Biosphere project, um, and so uh, are you familiar with Biosphere, by the way? Has anyone been to Biosphere before in Arizona? You guys should go. It's a it's a billion dollar building, and it, today's mm -hmm. money would cost billion dollars. Was built in the early nineties, mm -hmm. um, and it has number of uh, controlled environment spaces mm -hmm. inside that you know replicate different climates around the world, and allows world leading scientists to work on climate research, water, energy, and so forth. So. Uh, this is our future farm at, uh, at Biosphere with University of Arizona uh, in one of the long buildings. So as I said earlier, we'll have three modules, production, research, and education. Um, so and then as an example of technology company, um, for example, mm -hmm. we might... Uh, yeah, so that's with, a perfect yeah. example of licensing agreement, correct? We have a partner mm -hmm. in New York who is doing you know, another different interesting concept where you can grow out your crops in the vertical farm and then drop a model, module into a, a restaurant or a grocery store and they can finish off the growing on their facilities, harvest the crops when they need it, fresh, and then you replenish, kind of like a uniform cleaning service, correct? So you run out of uniforms, you have a locker and they bring you fresh uniforms every week or every day. It's kind of the same idea. So they bring you uh, the seedling fully grown yeah. and you just you just do the final grow. So this is just one of many examples of different technologies. We can skip but there's, some of those yeah, slides. There's, yeah. a, there's quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of technology. Not quite so a bit, tons of technology. In summary, these are some good points. Vertical farming is a reality. It, it, took, all, it took root. It, actually, we have an industry. We have an association. We have members all over the world. We have universities that are calling for presentations like this. We have investors that now every VC you go to now have heard about vertical farming and private equity is interested in vertical farming and food companies are in, and actually farm credit and governments are interested. So it's here to stay. It's not going anywhere. It's not a crazy idea. It's a real industry. Um, uh, the companies that are interested in set, setting uh, uh, vertical farms uh, usually are food companies, distributors, uh, retailers. Uh, because they have a problem that they need to solve, which customers want to, to eat better quality food, customers want to eat local and organic, they want to know where their food comes from and what's in it. And when you're really mixing some crops and you have five different leaves from five different fields in Mexico and you get them through five distributors, it's hard to really quantify that and translate it in a simple message to a consumer on a label, label when the consumer in the store has 10 seconds to read it before they make a buying decision. How do you explain that? If you say local, people trust that it's local, it's better, it's fresher. When you say organic, at least it means it was verified, correct? It's more sustainable, it's verified. Um, and so, so that's, that's what we can provide to those companies. Um, uh, safe, okay, some, something about safety and, and food security. I think you mentioned at the opening, the food security issue. And that's even bigger than all of us can imagine because uh, what kind of food security do we have when we grow food out, outdoors? None, literally. And I'm talking about produce, I'm talking about commodity crops, I'm talking about animals. Uh, there is no food security, pretty much. Let's be honest about it. Any type of disease, we don't control anything, you know, not to mention climate change, hurricanes, and so forth. Imagine Puerto Rico having vertical farms with solar panels and generators that will be growing food tomorrow. No big deal, correct? So uh, we can do that. The technology is here. It's just about scaling this industry. So food security is a big, big plus, but also food safety. So food safety in U.S. lags the rest of the world. And let's be honest about it. And so our food safety laws have not been modernized since 1940s until in 2010, I think, uh, the Obama administration passed the Food Modernization Act that's being implemented right now as we speak. It took a few years to write regulations. We were actually part of that process, um, uh, working with federal government on defining urban agriculture, defining controlled environmental agriculture and vertical farming. And 
we realized in our research, testing, and working with regulators that we have a tremendous opportunity to raise the bar on food safety beyond anything that anybody could imagine. Because now we grow our crops in an enclosed building where air is being filtered and recirculating. Our water comes from a municipal source, and not from some well. It's and it's monitored daily, every second of the mm -hmm. day for our sensors and controls, measures. Everything is controlled and, and monitored, including workers who are trained, who are properly dressed and have bathrooms that they can use, uh, and on and on and on. So food safety is really a big deal. If any of you are investors that are thinking, thinking about investing in in farming, you know, that's something you have to consider. You know, what is your food risk? Uh, and, and you probably hear, you know, every few years we have a Salmonella or E. coli outbreak and people die. Uh, and it's not 100% preventable, but vertical farming can definitely raise the bar uh, much, much higher than even any regulations would anticipate. Um, well, what happened to Farm Here? So, no, Farm Here, we, we ran out of money eventually. And we uh, merged a company with a VC fund that invested our last round. They, they invested in a juicing company as well. So we really closed the shop from and stopped selling our crops to grocery stores because our labor cost was too high and our scale wasn't big enough. Okay, so, so, so Civic Farms is 2.0, as you mm -hmm. say. Correct. Realizing the experience that you had. The lessons learned, the millions and millions of dollars that we have, you know, wasted to some extent, correct? And and, and that's not unusual uh, when you have really disruptive businesses. It happens all the time. But the good news is Farm Here as a business, as an enterprise, is still alive and it's still kicking every day. Uh, Civic Farms is really a first in the world conglomerate of other vertical farms. So we call it Vertical Farming Alliance. What we've been able to, to do is put together a group of vertical farms, including us, uh, spanning from Los Angeles through Texas, Arizona, uh, Cleveland, Ohio, Toronto, New York, uh, London, uh, and beyond, and um, we're working together on scaling our industry. And not here's only scaling, map. here's a map of our, yeah. our partner farms. Um, and there is one for, for UK as well. Um, but, you know, generally speaking, you know, these are well operated, well designed, uh, and profitable or about to be profitable vertical farms. <laughs> so for the first time ever, we're achieving a real scale. Uh, this why I mentioned to you working with Amazon Fresh or Whole Foods Market and others. Now we can start servicing in multiple markets because one of the biggest challenges, um, and that's what investors ask us all the time is how are you going to scale that business, correct? Because it requires a lot of capital. It requires a lot of resources and know-how. And there is nobody else that have proven that it actually is scalable. And sometimes you get a silly question like, how can you scale your product? Well, people eat basil every day, correct? In New York or LA, like what's different? Do you have a farm here in Texas? No, not yet. You don't? Not yet. We will build one in Austin very soon. And that's what the three and a half million dollars you want to raise Yes, is. yes. Okay. So when you say Civic Farms is an alliance, mm -hmm. basically, it's an information technology no sharing. it's 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 beyond that so it, you can compare it to how tyson chicken was founded or whatever you know it's a more of a co-op enterprise mm -hmm. that's really going into a merger eventually so it's a roll-up of all these farms and it just takes few steps the first step was far, for forming real alliance okay let's share technologies let's share resources let's reduce our sgna because now we can buy together we can hire food safety consultants together on and on and on and so that's done the next step is roll all of them up under one umbrella. So that umbrella is Civic Farms with what we call global local brand. When you say roll up, that means you own them. Correct. Correct. That's what we're trying to do now. Trying. We need money to mm -hmm. do that, correct? Because we need to shore up, fund some of those farms. and, and so, But we have an agreement in place with all those farms that that's what we want to do. So the farms have been extremely eager to, to be part of this. Correct. And it's because of the multidisciplinary nature mm -hmm. They they have strong skills in certain areas, but they really need help in other areas. Yeah. So and we have learned early on, speaking about technology and mm -hmm. patents and IP, that actually we need to share our knowledge mm -hmm. because uh, it's to everybody's benefit. And none of those individual vertical farms have achieved the scale to have a full capability of developing their own IP and their own portfolio of technologies. They're just not there. So. Um, Collectively, we have a number of different technology solutions. For example, we have a fantastic um, aeroponic uh, prototype uh, running in LA with vertical greens. It's fully automated uh, robotics and, and really low cost and operating. 
great model now that could be licensed and will be licensed to all of our members, correct? So uh, if you want to license our technology, first you need to become a member, literally. So it's kind of a membership-driven organization at this point. I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. as opposed to groundwater, and I'm wondering right. why you prefer that to rain, collected rainwater. Is it just a scale issue? No, it's a food safety mm -hmm. issue because you, you, you don't control field water or rainwater unless it's filtered, correct? And not, and it, it, it doesn't have to be filtered. It, has mm -hmm. to, it could be treated. It doesn't have to be. But the main question is you have to first find out if it needs to be treated. Sure. To find out if it needs to be treated, you need to collect samples in the fields you need to test them, and it takes time and resources. And typically, farmers do not test water. Now, the Food Modernization Act that was passed in 2010 now will require farmers in the U.S. for the first time to test their groundwater or, or their rainwater. Whatever they're using, they need to test it from time to time. When I get water from Austin Municipal Water District, I can look up their certificates and their testing records, and it's pretty good. Okay, and it's safe and it meets all the regulations. So from that safe point of view, we're much more certain that we have safe water than collecting or using some kind of unknown source water into our fields. Now, I'm asking you because when we think of watering our trees here, for example, we know that rainwater is actually healthier for the trees of course. than city water. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. that's why I'm thinking, why is city water better for your plants than the rainwater that you might Correct. No, you're absolutely correct. The water needs to have proper softness and so forth, and we do treat water in our hydroponic right. system. It needs to be absolutely. chlorine in chlorine. Chlorine is taking out, chloramines yeah. are taking out, yeah. absolutely. It is being filtered, mm -hmm. yes, there's UV filtration, mm -hmm. there's multi-steps multi of... We even take municipal water and make it better, basically. Okay. But at least we know it doesn't mm -hmm. have Salmonella or E. coli in it. You know, that's... Okay. And to know how to treat it, um, it's being monitored in real time. So correct. it's it's going to... You will always know what the water consists of. Mm. You mentioned shifting mm. to LED lights, and obviously mm. these operations require some energy. Can you talk a little bit more about what you're doing to reduce energy consumption? Sure. Make it renewable or sustainable? Go ahead. Well, so... Um, Great question. LED lights uh, have the advantage of being able to use specific wavelengths, and so with that alone, you can cut out the wavelengths that plants don't, that are not very photosynthetically active. And so um, what you're able to do then is you're able to really optimize photosynthesis when it's needed. And what, what folks have figured out through researching controlled environment agriculture is they've figured out exactly how much light plants need in a day. And so you know, for instance, mm -hmm. how, the intensity of light that they're willing to take and then you also know, uh, you also know um, how much light they need over that day. And so you can constantly calculate exactly not too much light, so you're not wasting light, and also not too little so that you're compromising productivity. And translating this so, into business and energy, mm -hmm. for example, our first farm, we had our fluorescent lighting 24-7. Mm -hmm. We didn't know, but okay, if we can have it 24-7, maybe we can grow twice as much as you can do outdoors, correct? <laughs> of course, it didn't so work that way. But yeah. what, what Rebecca's saying, and if I may oh, sure. go here, ahead. thank go you, is, is, is really, you know, now you take that, you know, energy that you buy from, from your energy source and you translate this into a specific color of light that the plant actually wants, and that particular basil or kale likes a little bit different light because one is a cold weather crop, one is a tropical crop, and so forth. So you're not buying and wasting energy and you know burning it through light bulbs. It just doesn't make sense. Now, most importantly, technology is getting better. Maybe that's mm -hmm. something you can talk about, correct? The efficiency and efficacy of these lighting fixtures is constantly improving. Right. So in addition to studying photobiology and understanding the wavelengths and how much light certain plants need, um, it, they are getting becoming more efficient and they're becoming, the component tree is becoming uh, more stable, stronger. So when LEDs first came out, they got a bad rap because they didn't last very long or they burned out um, or they had issues with the component tree. Um, maybe the heat sinks weren't set up correctly. But a lot of that has been solved. And then there is still some more room for efficiency, not just with the LED chips themselves, but with the, the drivers and other things like that. So it's, uh, it's exciting because 
there's many facets of energy efficiency improvement, both with the plant science side, but also with the LED technology and innovation side. So if do one would question? do, I, I just want to follow up on one thing, because I know where you're getting into, and we get this question pretty often. If one would give me a million dollars, I could probably, you know, hire some experts and do an actual carbon footprint study that would translate, you know, everything mm -hmm. we do and compare it to traditional agriculture, including the actual vitamins that get into your stomach, correct? Because that's ultimately what we have to look at. It's not only flavor, but the quality and nutritional value of the crops that we produce and how much energy does it take to do them. And my gut at this point, I can mm -hmm. tell you, tells me that we are pretty close to be neutral. If you consider food miles, number one, and average USDA data again, uh, head of lettuce travel, travels in US on average 1,200 miles from the farm to consumer. Uh, so think about that carbon footprint from trucks and equipment and farms and agriculture runoff and all these things that we would need to come you know, into our equation. What Rebecca was saying is very important and that energy efficiency and understanding of light and understanding on how to grow and control the environment is getting better and better and we know more and we know more. So traditional farmers have an uphill battle with climate change, with regulations, with lack of water, uh, with you know soil erosion and many million other problems that they have. In our case, it's the opposite. Vertical farms five years from now are going to be more efficient and 20 years from now are going to be even more efficient. No, no glass ceiling because you want to control the environment so we don't want sunlight, correct? Now, there is a hybrid model too that we will some people implement, we embrace too, where in certain climates when you have plenty of sun, you can have a greenhouse on top of a vertical farm. Why not? Take advantage of the heat generated by lighting in, in the vertical mm -hmm. farm. You can pump that heat into the greenhouse above and it's free heat basically uh, mm -hmm. and so forth. And just in cities, we have plenty of CO2 outside, correct? We pump air through filtration, we bring the CO2, plants use it, and we exhaust, you know, pure oxygen. So it's pretty cool. And and all of that is very easy, easy to do, actually. That's that's a really good question because mm -hmm. um, people often think, well, light is free, you know, so why don't we just do greenhouses, which, and there are a lot of greenhouses out there. Um, but once you introduce a, a, a glass or, you know, film ceiling to your infrastructure, you also introduce increased disease, um, as you mentioned. Temperature, Tem temperature. changes, correct? I mean, so, with sun, the room would get warmer, so now we have to cool it more. So, we so you lose a lot of the, the you lose a lot of the benefits of controlled environment agriculture by introducing sunlight. Mm -hmm. And for the amount of light that you can introduce, it's usually not worth it. So it's a good That's question. Right. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, there's a lot of questions that I have. Uh, I'm gonna go simple. Do plants sleep? Yes. Yeah. Actually, yes, they do have circadian rhythm. That's right. They do sleep. And mm -hmm. actually, uh, for our research, we, we found that we can extend shelf life of, of plants by properly putting them to sleep. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. So we can make them last longer in your refrigerator. So that's why you don't turn on the light. Correct. Correct. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, the first approach to growing indoors, and again, with wheat growers, was as much light and nutrients and everything I can, so I'm going to have a bigger bud and so forth. Now, that's not necessarily true with all other crops. So, mm -hmm. especially with edibles like, you know, leafy greens, what the philosophy now of vertical farming is truly to replicate what mod Mother Nature does outdoors in a perfect way. Sometimes when the farmer gets lucky and they have a perfect season, let's figure out what that season is and let's replicate it indoors. That's the main drive right now. Go ahead, sir. So, I got two questions. Sorry. One, tilapia doesn't have a very good Correct. So have you thought about different fish to use in this environment? Absolutely, yes. And then second, from a financial perspective, what sort of returns do you get over how long? I mean, mm -hmm. you talk about high capital costs, talk about high labor costs, high OPEX sure. costs. Uh, that means you've got to sell a premium product, but I'm, I'm an investor. Mm -hmm. not, not a premium product. No, no, no. So. But how do I get my return if you get all those high costs? No, no, no. What I was talking about is what the challenges to vertical farming, correct? Mm -hmm. And those challenges are being addressed. We've been addressing them since you know 2010, effectively, as an industry. It's a very young industry. Now, today, number of our farms are profitable already. And our gross margins are anywhere from 40 to 60% on cost of goods sold. And so very, very healthy margins. Um, and... Uh, that depends, of course, on the scale. So the models that we have developed show a minimal scale. Now, a lot of mistakes done earlier were 
you know, not enough scale. Uh, that you know, very simple, just like in any business, correct? So some of the vertical farms were 5,000 square foot uh, operations that they would never work because uh, you can't support all that logistics, re you know, regulatory requirements, food safety programs, handling, processing, and all of that. You need to have scale. Uh, you also need to have scale for heavier human resources, correct, which you need to pay for. So um, the returns are very, very healthy. And it's cool about this business, as Rebecca said, it's very challenging because it's everything. Well, I say, wow, that's cool because I can make money on everything now, correct? I can have mm -hmm. an awesome consumer brand that might be 10x or 20x value five years from now. That's great. I'm going to have a nice portfolio of IP that might be valuable to IP companies and investors. And I'm also going to have a nice operating business with 40 to 60% gross margin. It's pretty good. Go ahead. Yeah, so, I mean, the answer is very simple. You can grow anything indoors under artificial light and, and, and in a controlled environment. There are still very few crops where you can make money doing it. So uh, some of the slides that Rebecca was showing, especially from Japan, they're demonstration farms that are even inside office buildings just to make, you know, create a pleasant environment for, for employees of these office buildings. And they demonstrate that they can grow wheat. And they do. Mm -hmm. And under artificial light, well, obviously, you know, still outdoor ground wheat is so inexpensive uh, as a commodity, we can't compete with our technology. We can grow it, we can't make money doing it. So, but that's not what we want to grow. What we want to grow is crops that are very difficult to be grown outdoors, that are unpredictable to be grown out, outdoors, that have a lot of flavor and nutritional value, and guess what? Customers actually want them. If they want them and they can't get them at a reasonable price or they can't get them consistently, that's what we want to grow indoors. Because the first recipe for a successful farmer is grow the crops where you can make most money on, correct? So why would I want to grow tomatoes, uh, potatoes, than if we can grow basil and, and, and strawberries, for example? But the technology is moving, as Rebecca mentioned earlier, from leafy greens towards fruiting crops. So strawberries, peppers, tomatoes. A lot of them are already grown in greenhouses. 80% of tomatoes that you consume in the U.S. are grown in greenhouses. And people say, well, but they still don't have a flavor. If I go to Italy, they're better tasting. Well, yeah, because the greenhouse in Italy is local. The greenhouse in the U.S. is in California. So mm -hmm. the fact, the problem is we need a greenhouse here in Austin to grow your tomatoes. And there are companies in Chicago now that do greenhouses on the rooftops. Gotham Greens are good friends and others that are doing a fantastic job. And they can't grow fast enough, and they have great margins, good pricing, their products are competitively priced, and they have great flavor, most importantly. So I, I think it's not a technology challenge right now. The challenge is how to package as a business that makes sense, how to locate, and what crops to grow, and where to sell them to. Mm -hmm. Selling them with a sign that says, uh, you know, grown uh, at Civic Farm? Yes. So, so people, you expect people to pay higher? No. no. Our, prices, our prices are actually at this point, we're already competing with traditional farmers. Our wholesale price to the retailer. You said that those farmers have uh, low margins. No, 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 no. I was talking about commodity crops. I'm sorry, maybe I wasn't clear, but I was talking about low margin crops like commodity crops. Such now, as wheat. the reason they have low margins on basil, mm -hmm. for example, because it spoils. They can't sell it fast enough. It's very delicate. Mm -hmm. They have huge amount of waste even processing off their field. So when you look at it, all of a sudden I have a product that historically it's hard to make money on. Now you can make money on it because it's fresh, it's consistent, <coughs> it's harvested the day before it gets to the grocery store, uh, it's grown in the perfect environment. Our waste is almost zero, literally. Okay, so uh, we have no disease, we have no pests, and, 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 and a consistent product. Our wholesale pricing to retailers or restaurants is in line or competitive, depends on the market. For example, we're still not competitive in Los Angeles because they have access to Salinas Valley, correct? But we are lower priced in Chicago and Toronto and even New York and not to mention London. So we're very, very competitive in those markets today. Yes. Yeah. You mentioned uh, like managing the carbon input side of the photosynthetic mm -hmm. process by just using the city air. Mm -hmm. Is there a case to be made that having one of these locally improved 
um, air quality? Yes. Or, mm -hmm. And does it break even with kind of the lost opportunity of a carbon sink by mm -hmm. having this lush green patch? Right. I, I would mm -hmm. strongly refer mm -hmm. you to that book that I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. That's exactly mm -hmm. what Dr. Despomier is talking about, all these challenge benefits, not only literally filtering city air, but filtering municipal waste. Uh, you know, gray water and black water. We can't obviously turn black water, which is really, really dirty, into something that's reusable, but easily by processing our water for our plant production systems, uh, we can turn it into drinkable water. No problem whatsoever. That's actually been done at a number of farms already. So there doesn't have to be any kind of manipulation to the internal like, atmosphere. Well, well, plants it, take carbon, and mm -hmm. so maybe you can talk in more so, detail. Plants grow better with a higher uh, CO2 concentration. So um, I, I know several vertical farms have experimented with bringing in um, CO2 from waste streams. You know, So that's something that they can do. That's done often with algae, microalgae, um, is utilizing exhaust streams of power plants and, or coal factories, for example. I'm sorry, not coal factories, but like uh, cement factories. But um, yeah, that's, I mean. Some examples are you're, mushroom you're, you're and growing, plants, You're example. growing yeah. up, and since you're growing up, you're um, absolutely displacing any footprint that you've taken over for growing. And you're growing more quickly, so you're able to generate biomass. The productivity of biomass over time is faster. And so you're sequestering that much more CO2 in vertical farming versus traditional farming. Mm. Just a follow-up question. Yeah. Can you call the What's that? Can you call the on yes. The we can. Oh, yeah, sure. sure. Yeah. So, uh, is this solution <laughs> modular? Can you make this mm -hmm. modular? I mean, you show the, the tiniest mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. make. Like, Fancy house or a restaurant that wants to yes, there are a number of solutions. So mm -hmm. anywhere from a restaurant size through there are a number of companies mm -hmm. that successfully have developed container vertical farms that you can drop. I mean, this is not what we do because we do operations at scale. Uh, but if you want to have a small operation that services your restaurant or you ha already have a farm and you just want to have value-added products or specialty crops that you want to grow consistently around, there are a number of companies that provide turnkey um, you know, container farms. So it's scaled at multiple sizes. Actually, there are a number of consumer. IKEA is now selling a vertical system, okay, hydroponic system. Uh, uh, there are a number of other companies that make homemade aquaponics or aeroponic grow systems. The first one is one of our mentors, Richard Stoner, who designed an aeroponics system for near space station in 1987. They were growing lettuces in space. He developed a uh, aero garden. You can probably go to Costco and other places. You can, it's been around in the market for 20 years or something. It's not new. Uh, so there are a number of different solutions as far as scale. What we do is commercial industrial scale. Yes, ma'am. Can you describe the ideal buildings that you're out looking for a building in your scenario? Sure. What would it look like? If it so any post industrial building uh, that has a food safety. Uh, number one, so that's that's a concern and good solid building envelope. What I mean by that is good insulation uh, and not a lot of heat loss because, you know, especially here in Austin with hot summers, correct? We want to make sure the building is well insulated. Um, but uh, the average footprint for our farms now is about 35,000 square feet. Uh, could be larger, depends on the market. City like Austin would house anywhere from eight to 10 vertical farms easily and would barely make a dent in the size of the market. Um, so, um, High bay, high ceiling, open columns, open space, uh, span, uh, big power service for sure, um, flat roof, that's about it. And we have more detailed specs, so if you're interested, I'll be happy to send it. Do you know the top of your head when you kill what hours, when you can do the average size and what you can see? Sure, we, we have we all have the information. Yeah, 35,000 square foot farm would require about 1,600 amp power service, three phase, 480. So it's not that big actually. Yeah, that depends. Mm -hmm. That depends. N number one, some of those questions are proprietary, so I can't give you guys like, all the details. Uh, but generally speaking, it depends on what crops we grow, correct? So what is our daily light integral, which is, you know, what is our timing of lights, the intensity of lighting uh, that translates to heat generation by lights, which we need to cool with our cooling systems, was the intensity of production, correct? So 
if we're growing you know larger head of heads of red lettuce it might be a different recipe than you know smaller uh, microgreens baby greens. Right? or baby greens for example you know what i'm saying so that load will change um and but you know if you sign my nda i'll be happy to give you some information a great a great building type would be um like old server buildings because they have a oh, yeah. sub a subfloor um, which is fantastic for plumbing and, and that kind of thing. And actually, there are interesting. Thank you for mentioning mm -hmm. this, Rebecca. This is wonderful because a lot of similarities. I have some friends in data server business, and and one of our partners, uh, Jen Zimmerman, who's a brilliant mechanical engineer who spent decade designing cooling systems for data centers. And we applied a lot of those solutions into vertical farms because we equally need to control air humidity, temperature, CO two levels. Uh, a lot of the early data centers have failed because of technology cha challenges, not in proper scale, and most importantly, they didn't know how to package the product and how to sell it. It was kind of similar with vertical farming. And our first venture, it was all those challenges that which we talked about was, you know, the, the scale, how to package and ch technology applications. And, and now we're calling this vertical farming 2.0. It's not only us, it's the entire industry. I think we're like, all those mistakes are now <laughs> in our memories and we're moving on to, to the next level. Hey, I'll buy it from you. That's How much perfect. Can I... <laughs> I'm wondering if you all in your market tailor your plant schedule to yes. easily. Easily. Yeah. Piece of cake. Instead mm -hmm. of having sunlight in the day, we'll have it at night. The plants mm -hmm. are st yeah. st not stupid, but <laughs> they will not know. <laughs> it's day they, or night. they don't know. They don't, yeah, they don't they, know. they'll not know. And, and, and it will be okay. We're not going to tell him, correct? We're going to keep it a secret. <laughs> yeah and uh definitely definitely mm -hmm. you know energy from the operating point of view um something i can disclose to you guys number one expense is still labor even with some automation second is energy and then everything else you know rent and seeds and inputs is far behind very very small percentage of operating cost uh, but energy is a big one for sure so we would love to talk to you about that mm -hmm. yes sir Yes, mm -hmm. yes. That depends on you know state and and if it's state or municipal, whatever it is. Uh, successfully at some of our farms, even the one in Chicago, we got you know grants and we got energy grants from energy companies. There uh, rebate programs for lighting, uh, especially if farm. you retrofit a farm from fluorescent to LEDs. Farm, uh, uh, farm, farm credit. Thing. There's all kinds of incentives. So, mm -hmm. uh, for example, if we would do a farm in Detroit, okay, and we would find a historical uh, Packard or some other, you know, old car manufacturers, historical industrial building, we can apply for historical tax credits and tax increment financing on the real estate side and probably get some grants from the city or county or federal uh, for all kinds of things. Uh, USDA, we work very closely with USDA. They have a fantastic program called REAP, which is energy efficiency and something I forgot now, but it's about really retrofitting farm equipment from um, you know, inefficient to more efficient, correct? So you can get a grant for breaching that gap on the cost side between, let's say, you know, HPS, HID, or fluorescent lighting comparing to LEDs, uh, and there are a number of other programs. So we actually have a great grant writer here in Austin who works with us. She was with NASA for many years, and she, she did a lot of their grant writing, and, and so we have pretty good understanding of the geography of subsidies and grants, and there's a lot there. We wish there would be more, of course. And so, sure. uh, some cities have, have been very progressive, and we're oh, hoping thanks. that Austin will follow suit. Yeah, we've been one example is Atlanta. Atlanta, Atlanta has a department um, under the mayor's office called the Office of Sustainability, and within that office, they have uh, a person dedicated wholly to urban farming. And so That's the first city in the U.S. that actually when, is a deputy working mm -hmm. under the mayor dedicated to urban farming. So when awesome. we when yeah. they they held a conference called Aglanta, and uh, <laughs> and they they chose three companies to come to the mayor's office and and do a pitch, and we were one of those companies, and we've since followed up with them. So they're definitely um, a potential city that we would build in. But uh, I think other cities are starting to follow suit, and, and it's just wonderful when you go into the mayor's office and you give your pitch and you have, you have the, the energy companies, the water companies, and the real estate, and everybody's saying, 
we want to make this a soft landing. We'll help you here. We'll help you here. We'll help you yeah, here. It's, Everybody it's, was so supportive, yeah, and um, it was it was exciting um, because places like Atlanta have to ship in 99% of their leafy greens. Yeah, can you imagine that? So we've met they, with, they the, with the mayor's office greens, so. and we had yeah. wonderful people from Georgia Department of Ag and their energy companies at the table too. Mm -hmm. And they gave us a report and they consume mm -hmm. $6.6 .6 billion of lettuces a year uh, just in that region, uh, that market. And 90, mm -hmm. what was it, 98, 98 or 99% 99 almost is imported mm -hmm. from other states. <gasps> Mm -hmm. Georgia with all that sun, come on. Plus they have urban deserts. <laughs> they have urban deserts that they're hoping to sure. bring alive. And so there's there are cities like that and I would love it, you know, Austin to, oh, to no, well, you know follow suit. Absolutely. But, um the, Oh, that's great. The Office of Sustainability. Great. Like, I think his title is Chief of Love Desserts. Something okay. Like that. That's great. great. Yeah. yeah. No, 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 not yet. No. We're yeah. we're pretty new to Austin, so yeah. yeah. Oh, that'd be great. Fantastic. That'd be wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you win tonight with yeah. every question. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Go ahead. Roughly, what's the total output worldwide? Do you have any idea? Do On you know? out of vertical farms? Vertical farms? No. I'll be honest with you. No, there are a number of reports you can buy from four to six thousand dollars per report. <laughs> but I, and seriously, people sell that stuff. Uh, I, I wouldn't trust it because uh, you know we, we're such a new industry. Uh, things change almost daily. I'm not exaggerating. And you know, farms fail and farms farms get born again uh, or new ones. And so um, there there would no there would be no good mark information. However. Just in general, I can tell you that a 90,000 square foot farm out of Chicago could service 0.8% uh, of the local supply. So that gives you an idea of how big this opportunity is. It's enormous, really. And, uh, who's the, what country's leading research and development? And so I think US is number one, correct? And, and then Agreed. Japan. And is, Japan is yeah. you know a little bit behind us. I mean, mm -hmm. Japan is bigger in size than vertical farms, again, called plant mm -hmm. factories. Uh, but we are more advanced on technology. No question mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. So there's a company in Austin called Lumitex that's where we've that's met. Where we yes, met. correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. So if you go to their website, and they've been around for a long time, uh, been in Austin for a long time. If you go to their website, all they show is cannabis, and that is a that is a big market for them. It's a, it's going to become a very large market. For them. It's only twenty five percent of their business today, but it's all over the website <laughs> because that's what they want to. That's what they want to. Uh, get to. Obviously, not a whole lot of Texas, but. <laughs> Question is in that area the uh, the LED science of uh, photobiology I think mm -hmm. you call it. I have heard at the Lumitex mm -hmm. that you can split out the different frequencies to do different things with a plant. Mm -hmm. so like for example, if you use a 232 nanometer wavelength, your tomato plant will grow taller. If you mm -hmm. use 312, it'll grow bigger leaves. If you use 432, you'll get more fruit. And if you use 563, you'll get redder tomatoes. How how accurate is that statement, and how well developed is the science of picking out that frequency? And I worry about all the rest of the okay. frequencies. What are we missing that we don't know? Even all the way down to the nutrition that you mentioned. Right? What time do they lock the building tonight? Yeah. To make sure. Seriously, now you yeah. got us going, but go ahead. So I'll I'll try to make this quick. The answer to that quick because I could talk about that for quite a while. Um, the quick answer is it's, it's extremely complex. We don't we don't know we don't know we don't know down to wavelengths how it will affect a particular plant, um, but it it really it comes down to the complexities of life. Two very similar related plants can have different responses to uh, to the same wavelength recipe. So it's um, it all comes down to genetics. Once we can understand and map the effects of light, and once we understand how genes are being expressed and 
how uh, genetic control is taking over when it comes to photobiology, then we should be able to um, predict, have predictive models to how light can affect different plants based on their genetic code. But we're not there yet, and we're actually a ways away. So I, I uh, know this firsthand because I, I was an engineer for many years, and then I got into biology. And um, I came in as an engineer thinking I could control all of my parameters, and when I couldn't, I took it really hard, <laughs> and I beat myself up because it meant I was a bad engineer. But finally, the scientists told me and explained to me, you know, this is life. Life is extremely complex. You can have the same culture growing for, for a year, and one day it crashes. And so um, understanding how light affects plants at this day and age is mostly done through observation and experimentation, through statistical analysis, but more and more it will be done by understanding the genetic code and tying that to genetic response and tying that to real-time real -time, uh, DNA and RNA um, expression. That, that's where we're headed, but it's going to be a while before we can know specific wavelengths. But a, a lot of people are doing specific wavelength testing, and that's only possible because of LEDs. And so it's, and there's some good results. I mean, that's you know that's without we, we do understanding know, specific right. spectrum, correct? Like you said, you know, five thirty six, correct? Maybe it's not five thirty. We don't yeah. know, but we know that more blue light will make the plants shorter or more more dense, correct? We know that. We all know that. We've been doing this for, for as an industry. Mm -hmm. uh, we there are know definitely that certain trends. Absolutely, and certain trends. Recipes light can influence the color. Mm -hmm. You know, do we want more red out of the lettuce or not? We can change that with light. To some extent, we've seen experiments with flavor. Mm -hmm. Do we want to make our arugula more spicy or not with certain light spectrum? Mm -hmm. But these spectrums are much broader than what you mentioned. You know, you, you said 536 and Rebecca gave you a specific response. We don't know, correct? Mm -hmm. Because it's a blend of less orange, I mean, less pink mm -hmm. or maybe more pink light and a little bit more blue in their variety of different experiments. And there is some research and not only research, but practical results already uh, out of the different spectrums. But I wouldn't make such a bold statement that we precisely know with this spectrum we can make tomatoes bigger. Yeah, I imagine it's very early in the whole mm -hmm. Are there recognized leaders in, in this specific area? Um, well, there's a company called BIOS that I've started working with as a consultant. Um, and their, their work focuses on the interaction of light and humans, as well as the interaction of light and plants. They do a lot of... A lot mm -hmm. of um, fundamental research um, and actually two or three of their employees worked for NASA and have lights that are now on the space station and so they've actually studied receptors photoreceptors both in human eye as well as receptors in plants to really understand how to optimize light and they also have pretty amazing uh, innovation when it comes to the LED side of things too on so, the research side, yeah. uh, probably Dr. Koza mm -hmm. in Japan mm -hmm. um, is a leader in LED research. And um, Dr. Cherry mm -hmm. Kubota, the University of Arizona, recently departed from there, but we've been working with her for a while. She's done a lot of research on LEDs and things exactly that you have been talking about. Uh, so in Rebecca in the group, too, uh, there are very few, but the, you know, technology is getting there. It's very interesting and, and exciting. but. One thing I would really like to mention to you and others, light is only part of the recipe, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to look at all other environmental perimeters and controls and measures from the nutrient side, the uptake of nutrients, the plant root zone, the water temperature, the ambient air temperature, humidity levels, CO2 levels, the air movement, air flow, uh, what's called vapor pressure deficit. So like the plants are sweating like as we are, correct? Mm -hmm. So the pressure above the leaf and below the leaf is different. Mm -hmm. All these things, that Mother Nature figure out how to do for billions of years. You know, now we just need to replicate and maybe, in my mind, sorry, Rebecca, you're a scientist, I'm just an architect, but stop <laughs> asking questions at some point. Just give up. Say like, okay, I'm going to do what works in California. They grow it every day. This is the perfect temperature. I'll just do that. And I don't know why it works, but it works for me as a business, correct? Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> go ahead. Do you think plants are sensitive? 
Oh well, my gosh, I got that question. I'm a scientist, so. Okay, so <laughs> can I answer that oh, quickly? Because sure, sure. as a scientist, you're, I know what you're you going to say. You know what I'll say. Yeah, but if you would ask one of my master growers in Chicago, uh, his name was Max, fantastic guy, and very passionate about aqu aquaponics, and he was playing all kinds of music to the fish, he would say, absolutely. Mm -hmm. They eat differently, they sleep differently, uh, and, and so forth. And actually, they do. I believe that because I've seen it with my own eyes. Actually, they this not only music, they react differently when we would have tours at our farm. And we had over, I would say, 12,000 school kids for our farm. We had a program with City of Chicago as well on educating kids for you know elementary, high school level on food production and so forth. And when we would see different age of people coming into the farm, age it was interesting. Adults, investors coming in for a tour or kid, high school kids, the fish would react differently. So uh, now I don't know about plants, to be honest with you, but you know, some people say they do. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with good music in a farm, correct? So <laughs> just, just play it. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. Is there any potential to transfer some of the technologies or some of the IT to improve the efficiency of greenhouse operation? Because Absolutely. Mm -hmm. not afford the vertical farm. Correct. Mm -hmm. so, so generally speaking, there are a lot of similarities between greenhouses and what we do. However, one fundamental difference is that we would never call a greenhouse controlled environment agriculture because it's not controlled enough. And greenhouses look at us and say, oh, yeah, no, we're in the same group. And no, not really, because you have sunlight and we don't. You have a cloudy day and we don't. You have, you know, in Arizona, you have in, in winter, you have temperature fluctuation on the surface of the greenhouse and condensation issues in between day and night that are tremendous. We don't. And on and on and on. So our level of control of the environment is much higher. But generally speaking, from hardware point of view, correct? Oh, Pumps, water circulation, mm -hmm. nutrient delivery, um, best Light, management. Uh, Light wavelength uh, research. Yeah, I mean, all mm -hmm. kinds of things, you know, even building envelope. A lot of modern greenhouses are very sophisticated. And from the capital point of view, they don't cost that much less than a vertical farm. Because you have greenhouses that have cooling systems, the humidification, heating, and so forth. And they also, all, almost a vertical farm without being a vertical farm. So my, you know, me personally, and I'm sure you would agree, we control much more, but there are a lot of transfer opportunities on IP, absolutely. Okay, anybody have any more questions? Yeah, last question. Okay, get his email address. If you're an architect, you can answer, get her an address. Thank you guys so much, very, really, very, really. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. 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 Thank you.